Namaste Galactic family and welcome back to the channel Indigo Angel. Come on into this dimension guys as we have an incredible information packed show for everyone today. We will be touching on some topics of the ancient spiritual history of Ireland, the Tuatha de Danann and the four sacred objects of Ireland and we are also going to be getting into some spicier topics such as the prostitution history and Mary Magdalene laundry facilities and something that's we've been wanting to talk about on my channel for a while actually is this darker part of Irish history and the desecration of the divine Sophia. So we're going to be really touching on a lot of topics today. We're going to be touching on Parthenogenesis creation and really tying it into the sexual misery programs and all of this stuff. So a lot to dive into today. I just wanted to bring on two of the most educated women that I personally do know on these topics, as I'm here to learn today as much as you guys are in some of these things, because I really don't have a lot of deep Irish history roots and culture. I'm not really innately, um, I don't have a lot of uh, a bloodline connection to Ireland. So I'm really going to be learning from you ladies so much. So I really appreciate you guys being here. And um, I want to go ahead and start by introducing you guys one by one. And so Marguerite, um, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. I'm so honored to be here, Indy, and also to be with Zoe on these amazing topics. And Zoe, how are you doing today? I'm great, Indy. Yeah, I'm so happy, so happy to be here. Thank you so much for inviting me and delighted to be here with Marguerite as well. So in the past, me and Marguerite have done some shows together. Uh, also with Z Earth Star, we did the womb healing container show. And so I really just want to recommend you guys so you can familiar familiarize yourself more if you, especially if you're new to my channel, um, I uh, would refer you guys back and uh, go take a look at some of the shows that we've done before. We've really touched on some interesting topics. Um, we've dived into the reptilian programs, the forest breeding programs. We've dived into, you know, more extensively on Parthenogenesis creation. We've talked about the Fae, the dragons, all of these things. So please go check out the last two videos that I've done with Marguerite, Z Earth Star. Um, as I think you guys will find all of this very interesting and um, ex expanding uh, into the different facets of spirituality on deeper levels. Part of the Genesis creation is something I don't think a lot of people are really talking about. So if you don't know what that is, check out these videos that we did. So uh, I think we'll start maybe just a little bit, Marguerite, if you don't mind just kind of telling everyone a little bit about um, your background and how you kind of came into talking about Parthenogenesis creation. Yeah, greetings, everybody. Um, so just briefly, I have always been fascinated with the divine feminine and ancient priestesses and modern priestesses. And I have been researching this for, I don't know, 30 years or more, went to grad school. And while I was in grad school at the California Institute of Integral Studies, doing my master's thesis on Demeter and Persephone, who are mother daughter goddesses, in a way they're kind of like twinning goddesses. And I learned from an author that really their story is about mother daughter self-replication no males really were involved. And when I was reading everything she was saying about that, I had like the sense of, you know, my crown opening like a shoot and just this information pouring in that was the following. Oh my God, virgin birth is real. So that was in 2001. And I was already set to start researching everything I could about priestesses of ancient Greece and when I started looking at that historical, legendary, and mythological material with that thesis in my mind, I started finding all of this information showing that divine birth was an actual practice of these highest holy women in Greece. 
And by extension, through my research, I realized this was in Egypt. This was in Mesopotamia. This was in North America. This was really all over the world. And as we've been expanding and expanding on this topic, I'm realizing that, you know, through inspiration from Indy, this goes back to Lemuria and probably beyond to an original human form where we were hermaphroditic or androgynous. And we we automatically gave birth this way because we didn't even have to unify the sexes in order to have a procreation. So that's just a very short story of how I got started on this. And I'm very, very passionate about this. I've been writing about this and how it relates to Mother Mary and much more. Thank you so much for letting everybody know about that. Um, and Zoe, tell us a little bit about you as well. How did you get talking on some of the subjects that you've brought forward? I just want to let everybody know that uh, me and Zoe had a very touching and in-depth conversation uh, not too long ago where she brought the attention of the Mary uh, Magdalene Laundry facilities to me um, with some of the research that she's been doing. And it was just such a profound thing. I didn't even know that these existed. And so how did you get into learning about that and all the other stuff that I believe you're doing some filming on? So maybe fill us in on your projects and just how you got started on doing those. Yeah, well, my background is in um, documentary research. Actually, I'm a documentary researcher. And before that, I studied computer science. So, but for years, I've had a dream to start a company which is called Eru, based, um, which is the name of a sovereignty goddess of Ireland, one of the two at Dedanon. And I've always been fascinated with Irish mythology, especially these Celtic goddesses, especially, um, you know, Ireland got her name from Eru, this goddess. Essentially, that's a divine feminine name for a country. And we have this very rich history of these strong Celtic divine feminine goddesses and this kind of respect still still exists especially through Bridget and well-known figures and there are many lesser known ones but however this got distilled some a lot over the years um that typical suppression of the divine feminine so I have always been fascinated by that I started a company with my partner where we're reclaiming um the Irish wool industry were making woolen blankets, which was kind of in combat, combating a, this tragic decline of the Irish wool industry, which is another story. But um, I've I've always been interested in the stories and researching because I was saying I'm like a nerd like that. And I have been through working with the energies of these goddesses for the company as my guides. They my, have been my guides for years. I've been looking deeper into the mythology, which they've been guiding me to. I did work with Marguerite. I was studying under Marguerite and I did a lot of her courses. Um, she put together many pieces for me, especially um, my understanding and our understanding of the parthenogenetic birthing that we believe was going on with these Celtic goddesses as well. Um, so again, looking especially with their at their relationship with the land, they were so deeply associated with the land. There was a goddess associated with each part of the land. Um, and that still exists to this day. Still, different areas are called after after different goddesses. They had such a strong connection to the earth. And I realize how much that has to do with grid working. You know, they were essentially grid workers. So I'm learning and opening up to all that now through your work, Indy, through Z's, through that womb container. Um, so all of these pieces are kind of coming together. And I really feel that, um, you know, they are coming back into our consciousness now for us to remember these ancient, reclaim these ancient wisdoms yeah. to bring in at this time of our ascension. And that's so awesome. So you are you're located in Ireland, right? You're somewhere yeah. where where are you in Ireland? Yeah, so I'm in Dublin, the capital city. That's where I'm from. My partner is from Wicklow, which is um called the Garden of Ireland. It's a beautiful county next to Dublin, famous for its mountains, famous for its gold and quartz in the mountains, which apparently are stories of the the quartz being um brought over to Stonehenge, actually from the Wicklow Mountains. 
Um, there's a lot of interesting stuff in the land there. When Marguerite actually visited Ireland in the summer, we went and did a lot of kind of visiting around. There's many sacred sites around there, stone circles. And um, so I spend my time between those two places. So I find it so fascinating because I don't really uh, touch on the history of Ireland or the spiritual, you know, cosmology, mythology that much on my channel. So maybe if you guys wouldn't mind, just kind of start with the basics. Like, what is the Tawatha de Danon and what is the four sacred objects of Ireland? What does this all actually mean? Well, I'll just say a little bit, and Marguerite actually has helped me really look at this from, from another perspective, which has put a lot in, so maybe she can speak after. For me, um, the, the Tua de Danin um, translates into English as the tribe of Danu. So Danu was a famous um, goddess. So even though she isn't necessarily... <coughs> personified as a goddess like um Bridget like the others she is like for me it's like the great mother so for me my understanding is like they're like the tribe of the great mother um interestingly I found a reference to Danu um being the mother of in the Rig Veda actually being the mother of the firstborn of dragons so I know that the tribe of Danu, the two of the Danu, are very connected to, to dragon energy. That's what I feel and I believe. Um, I believe they were here at a time. Um, they came when there were other races in Ireland and they came, I feel, to reclaim and to reseed um, divine lineages and, you know, heal the land and to seed codes into the land and work with these sacred sites, work with the hierogamic energy to um, to help, you know, uh, enlighten the planet. And then there was a time where they were taken over by another race. So there was all these, a lot of their mythology, when you look into it in Ireland, is all about battles. Um, you know, a lot of them are very gruesome battles. But really, from my understanding now, is like, they were fighting, defending the land away from invasions, these invading races. And I think it was, you know, all to do with, you know, the DNA, the fall, the those cataclysms, that timing that they were um, trying to uphold these original templates when this other, you know, these other invasions and interferences were, were coming in. So this was at a time where the, the, the Celtic goddesses were very powerful and very strong. And they agreed in the end to, um, you know, recede um, as long as the land would be called after Eru. So her name would be remembered. And and that's when they apparently receded kind of into the hills and they kind of became or morphed into or merged with the she. So Marguerite is very good mm. for me in explaining a lot of this. So I don't know if you want to add to that. Yeah. Oh, thank you. That's so beautiful. And I really appreciate <clears throat> the images and the Wikipedia uh, entry here. Yeah. Um, I think what's happening is we're starting to piece together this ancient history about Ireland after it's been veiled and um, sort of turned into something else like storybook land <laughs> type um, stories. But yeah, these Tuat de Danan are considered the shining ones. So they're considered like partly a race of beings that have high level powers. So they're very high interdimensional beings that are, again, equated with the she, S-I-D-H-E, who are often equated with the fairies or the, the fae. I think what's happening is here is we're seeing layers of how these beings are interdimensionally connected or ancestrally connected with the dragons, with the fairy elementals of the earth, with the higher angelic beings, and with this goddess, Danu, who whose name appears everywhere, not just where you were saying. She prominently is in the Greek tradition, and she prominently is in the North African tradition. And the early uh, female females who came up and founded like the mysteries to Demeter um, from Egypt up into Greece 
were venerating Danu as well. So there's something about this great goddess and all of these beings that are tied into our ancient history that is a, a, a lineage that all humans belong to, essentially. So that's what we're talking about here. And we're trying to unearth what are these connections? How did they procreate and reproduce? How much are they in the third dimension? How much are they in the fifth dimension? How much are they in the inner earth? How much are they in the outer earth? You know, is this all just a phase shift, a dimensional shift? You know, this is this is stuff that we're all kind of starting to remember in our dreams, in our intuitions, in our medicine sessions. And I just really invite everybody to start tuning into these beings and, and finding out what do you already know and what are you receiving? Because I think there's a very great drama that's happening on planet Earth that is intimately connected with these beings and then also lineages of them that have to do with King Arthur and Guinevere and you know the entire British Isles, so to speak on into what is happening with the Royal Lines today and what has been happening with these great health cataclysms and political cataclysms and economic cataclysms. So it's all sort of we're, we're trying to unveil, unravel um, what's happening so that we can understand what's really happening to us today. Wow, so much deep connection with all of this. Um, really fascinating. I was researching just a little bit last night, and it and it said they um, that they could have came from the Hyperboreans. Does that sound like that could be a part of at yeah, least in yeah. terms of the root race in which they descended? I think so. That's what I feel. That's more and more what I'm I'm feeling and what I'm getting to, and just. Yeah, there's just a lot of interesting things coming up around that. It seems to, it, it feels right more than anything. Yeah, and I think the Hyperboreans, um, I don't know if you locate them anywhere on the earth in particular, either of you, but my sense of them is they're really, you know, an astral race. And I've seen them connected with the Pleiades, but um, I'm sure, Indy, you have a lot more information about the Hyperboreans. They are mentioned in the Greek tradition that like Apollo would go, go to Hyperborea during um, I think it's like the summer months mm -hmm. and Dionysus would then be the Oracle at Delphi instead of him. So mm -hmm. it's like, well, where was this place? <laughs> Clearly it's an abode of the gods. Uh, so my next question though, I really kind of wanted to capture this because I was making some correlations with the grid work that I was doing and the tools that we use in our grid work sessions. They're very, um, similar mm. to the, uh, four treasures of Ireland or the four gifts. So could you guys go into maybe explaining what those are and what those mean? Like these sacred relics? Yeah, well, I just, just the stories, as the stories go, they, they brought these four gifts to Ireland from where they came from. And, um, there were, there, there was the spear of Lu, who's the sun god. There was the sword of Nuada, who was a high king. There was, um, the cauldron of Andagda, who was another solar god. Um, and then there was the Stone of Destiny, which was under the protection of all the sovereignty goddesses. So it is really interesting. Um, just some of your things from grid working I was reading, like some of the tools you use mm -hmm. are actually um, sounded similar. I was like, whoa. And um, myself and Marguerite, and uh, we did... Uh, talk about some of these and we did a video with our friend Lisa do you know what I'm so sorry my baby is crying so I might have to just take her hair for a second is that okay yeah um, sure come back to this Marguerite do you mind taking over for a second sure not at all yeah Excuse um, me. one second yeah um so yes yeah, so these four gifts you know I mean these great beings confer gifts on humanity we have Demeter, who gave the gift of grain growing. 
um, Dionysus, who gave the gift of wine built, you, you know, wine mm -hmm. cultivation. Mm -hmm. And so here we have these sovereignty goddesses, essentially, is what I think these things come from, that are bestowing these gifts upon humanity so that we can use them for our own magical purposes, if you will. I mean, each one leads to some kind of um, gift or special ability. Um, we've looked at the stone of destiny, you know, in all of our conversations, uh, previous conversation that I've had with Zoe and Lisa Espinosa mm -hmm. and with you, Tara, um, mm -hmm. with you, um, Indy, uh, about, um, you, you can call me Tara now. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, I'm, I'm just like tuning into, to that aspect of you, um, <clears throat> that this was really a stone of divine birth. I mean, it was a place where conception, sacred marriage conception rites could take place when it wasn't portrayed as that phallus as you have there, which is a total stealing and replacement of what it was. It was like a bed, really. It was, okay. it was the wrong thing. So, um, you know, so, so is there is there an actual picture of where this is or where is the actual stone? The stone of destiny? They have one in um, in Scotland. And they have one in Westminster Abbey. Um, originally, the original Stone of Destiny was thought to have gone to Westminster Abbey and been used for the coronation of the kings and the queens there um, mm -hmm. for years until the 50s when these several college guys got all incensed that this thing was over there and they took it, but then they then it went to, to Scotland. So there's been this rivalry between Scotland, England, and Ireland, <laughs> you know, for this for this object. Um, so there's one in Scotland. I think there is like another one. Um, but it's used, you know, to confer divinity. This is mm -hmm. this place, the Hill of Tara, was where the kings of Ireland were said to be coronated. And there was something about wow. that these um, and maybe Zoe's back with us that these sovereignty goddesses are the ones who really bestowed the royalty, the uh, kingship. And there may have been some kind of sacred marriage rite that was done as a part of this. I mean, literally a sex rite. Wow. Uh, that's so amazing. Um, and so one thing that I heard about the stone of destiny oh. was that it can be opened or it can be accessed and that it will sing or it will vibrate and that there's actual codes that will come from it. Is that how it works? Is it like the, the, is it a special person has to have the certain codes to be able to access the stone or. Yeah. I think Zoe has more information. I, uh, yeah. Well, I know that the, the sovereignty goddesses, they, used the stone of destiny to coronate the rightful king and to discern the rightful king so apparently when the rightful king and for from that i understand that that is the 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 man who em embodied the sacred marriage within himself who was in harmony with the divine masculine feminine relationship within himself um in a rightful balance with that when he stood on the stone it would it would make a sound so whether that was you know a vibration or it was a part of the process of discerning mm -hmm. the rightful king so you know they were coronating um you know and confirming these royal lines these kings in in keeping with these lineages that they were seeding into you know bringing to continue bringing in these royal lineages and I believe on these sites, there were uh, many sites where they um, practiced this sacred marriage ritual, where they would coronate um, the kings at that time, that through these rituals, you know, which were essentially positive, hierogamic union, positive rituals, which would have involved the community, um, a celebration, I'm sure, like um, that that was creating you know, sacred, positive energy, hierogamic energy that would be seeding into the grid, right? Mm -hmm. So that was like a form of, that was grid working. So they were working with the templating in that way, I believe. And, you know, the divine birthing was probably a part of that, that they would enact the sacred marriage ritual. 
the sovereignty goddesses were um were known for using mead which is like a drink made from honey which um was like i imagine it's like cacao like it would be connecting them to the land because they were spokeswomen for the land Mm -hmm. you know because when the when they confirmed the king the king would become the guardian then of the land of that area of the land Mm -hmm. so you know this is what i love about them they were in this rightful balance with the divine feminine as the tribe of danu where they listened to you know, they respected the voice of the feminine who spoke for the, you know, the feminine land, you know, Gaia. And they then, you know, respected her word, her discernment, coronating this king who was also in balance with this, this rightful balance of energy within himself. And then they would become the masculine and feminine guardians for the land and therefore be able to bring through these divine children, you know, which was keeping the lineages you know, that was serving the community, then that was also serving the earth, serving the planetary grid. And then also the interesting thing is if you look up sacred marriage rituals in Ireland now in Wikipedia or something and a lot of studies, you can find some pretty gruesome stuff on it, which I believe was the inversion of all these rituals, which was you know, when the interference took place, these rituals, which were, I believe, so beautiful, um, were inverted to turn into something very disturbing, where there's talk of this horse sacrifice would take place. It was essentially the, it was really brought down to a base level, talking about the, you know, sexual relations being used in such a base way. Um, they they would kill a horse and all the community would drink, partake of the drinking of its blood. I mean, for, for me, this is the, the the beautiful sacred marriage ritual turned on its head and simply inverted and then inverting again the, the codes, right? Ripping apart the sacred marriage or the true meaning of the sacred marriage codes because it was all about the king then, you know, so how would they know about where the locations are of these sacred marriage locations? And so was it through these rituals that they would, you know, s- consecrate the land for those sacred marriage locations? Because I know you've talked about the invasions coming in and desecrating these sacred marriage location so do any of them still exist today are there any actual known places that are true heroes gamos encoding in the land yeah well i believe there's i mean there's six royal sites they're still called royal sites and tara being the central one which kind of culminated you know the 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 king crown there would be the king of of the whole of ireland um and so everyone so the whole the whole of ireland is the sacred heroes gamos land the whole, yeah, the whole i mean you know like in a way i think there's so much that that we're just uncovering that is to do with the heroes gamos energies in ireland mm-hmm. and that's why i think they've been particularly targeted and inverted and that's why they're particularly out of balance and this suppression has happened like which led to the magdalene laundries as we spoke about yeah. but Back to your point, I think, yes, there are specific royal sites that are still are well-known tourist sites today. Um, but the story, when you go there, when you hear about them, it's more about the high kings. You know, this is about yeah. the high king. Whereas for me, it's so fascinating that it was really the sovereignty goddesses that led you know, these things. And I believe in these places, like myself and Marguerite and uh, our friend Lisa were there. There were, I believe there were like, you know, priestesses, like houses of women, like as Marguerite saw at Tara, um, whether they, they were, you know, kind of temples for the divine birthing or how that worked. Marguerite, you have a better explanation of how those kind of houses worked, even in relation to, you know, King Arthur, when you spoke about how those kind of houses of women, you know, Yes, yes. Well, you know, first of all, the mountain itself has long been considered to be the womb. So the, <laughs> right away, mountains are womb portals. And so we have the hill of Tara, which is, you know, a mound, essentially a mountain. That in and of itself is a feminine energy. 
It's a feminine portal. So anything that goes on there is about the conception regarding that womb place. Okay, so probably all of these places are considered womb locations. You know, I did a lot of study of ancient Greece. Um, it's always considered the mountain and beyond. The mountains are always considered the mountain mother. They're either the womb or the breasts, you know, of the goddess of the sacred feminine. What we also have in the English tradition mm -hmm. is the castle. So the castle was like a kind of a portal that was created or put on some of these other sites. And it's clear in the Arthurian tradition that there were like um, Arthur's mother, Egraine, was the head of the castle of the maidens. This would have been a divine birth priestesshood that's being described, right? And so these castles might have been like the early day churches, because you know how churches are put on the grid points to sort of siphon off and take it. So the castles might have been a kind of a migration along those lines where they're still keeping some of that ancient energy. It's not quite the Catholic church usurpment, but it's like a technology that's being put on these places. So the castles, the stones, you know, all of these types of things are being used for these various purposes. What you're showing there is a mound that is on the Hill of Tara near where the um, Stone of Destiny was. And, you know, you read the signage, Zoe, you know more than I do, that it's like, oh, you know, this might be where they took prisoners, blah, blah, blah. But some people think that it's in, it's an interdimensional portal. That, you know, literally, this is an entryway into the inner earth, where these beings are in some dimension. Mm -hmm. Wow. This is all just so amazing. Um, what I was kind of starting to think about now was these Mary Magdalene laundry facilities. So clearly there's been this great imbalance of the divine feminine energy that has taken over the globe since the fall of man through all kinds of different invasions through the, the Jesuits, the Khazarians, the black nobility lines. So maybe let's talk about this darker side of Ireland's history and what's kind of happened in terms of these particular bloodlines, maybe the bloodlines of the descendants of the original Ioni tribes from Lemuria, um, all of the the Irish lines of the women that are carrying these fleur-de-lis implants, if we kind of refer back to some of the um, Lemurian implants that we talked about in the womb healing container, um, so there's been this great desecration of the divine Sophia, um, and it's resulted in just the suppression of the divine feminine energy, because clearly they don't want that to rise up. Clearly, they don't want that to come into its empowerment, because that would take away the patriarchy power. This would take away um, the power from these black nobility lines. So... Um, where does this kind of start in terms of Ireland, like the first original oppression of these things? Was it kind of at the Mary Magdalene facilities? This is kind of like where it, it the head of it started to expose itself more so in Ireland? Well, yeah, I, I, Zoe, I know you're going to talk about that. I, I want to first talk about the banishing of the dragons. The mm -hmm. banishing of the serpents was a major event that happened in Ireland by someone supposedly St. Patrick, um, who maybe thought he was doing good. I don't know. There was some sort of magical thing that went on to banish the serpent protectors from these sites, among other things. And so once you leave a land unprotected, then all sorts of things can come in. Because, you know, not only did the warriors get decimated and the Celtic, you know, this was this was how the Celtic Church, which predates Christianity, um, was infiltrated. The removal of the dragons, and so we're we're sort of all preparing for a great ritual when the time is right to return to call those dragons back yeah. 
to Ireland en masse. So it was really about the desecration of the dragon's body parts. I think we've talked about that a little bit from some of Lisa Renee's work. She's talked about the dragon being slayed and actually put in different locations all over the world. And it's about reclaiming her body parts. And I think this might even started with the slaying of Medusa's head. That that was because I I received a vision. You know how we love to get our downloads in the shower time. Um, That this reversal fifth dimensional portal that's you know sucking all of this energy this satanic energy that is feeding off of the black madonna energy was opened at the time that her head was cut and then taken to the vatican so i've been kind of obsessed with that for the longest time because i just have this feeling that you know all of the the rising up of the divine feminine the power of that exists in medusa's head like it's in yeah. her head, like, and that that reattachment is something that is actually very symbolic. It is something that is very important that it is. I mean, think about where her head is located. The Vatican was, they took over a, a, an original pagan cemetery, which was ruled by the goddess pagan Vatica, which represented I think in Latin vagina, which was like the power point in the earth of the dragons, like her dragon earthly, her root chakra, her root power. So they've taken and slayed her head, taken the power of the divine feminine and placed it in that place of the land of of power to hold that hostage. So the point I'm trying to make is that it's about it's about reclaiming the divine feminine's body parts and rebuilding and putting her back together. That's right. And in the historical record, Medusa was a divine birth priestess of North Africa. Okay. Okay. So she was busy. And <clears throat> so it's like... The desert- no, no, real, real quick. North Africa. Was Athena's temple goddess Isis' temple? That's, that's what I was, that's what I was no. wondering the other day. Have you heard anything like that? I think there's a lot of overlap with Isis and those goddesses, whoever they are, which we're trying to figure out what that is. And Medusa would have been a priestess of Athena, who is also connected with Danu and the the women of Danu, the the Danaids, were 50 divine birth priestesses of North Africa who were rain magicians and, you know, so it's like, there's a connection between Artemis, Athena, the Danaids, Danu, the Pleiades, Medusa, Demeter, Persephone, as like the positive female energies that were taken over by these male Anunnaki beings coming in and trying to run the show and rape them. So, you know, um, so that's I'm, where we get to the Mary Magdalene. That's right. I know we okay. Get back to that. okay. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> no, but that's really important, Marguerite. What Marguerite was saying, and she, and, and she, you really helped me kind of piece that together. You know, the banishing of the dragons, the banishing of the snakes, and an interesting thing is the goddess Bridget, who is well known. She was kind of like the goddess that was allowed to exist. You know, from the two of the because they couldn't banish really all of them. So they turned her into a saint, St. Bridget, who's still well, you know, respected today. But I only realized recently before Marguerite came over was was that um, Bridget's head has been, was removed, whether this was from her, after her burial. Either way, it's it's a symbol of removing the head from the body and it was brought at the time of, it was brought by, um, a, when you read into it, it's it was brought by apparently two gentlemen, war, gentlemen knights, they're described as, during the time of the Inquisitions, and um, brought to a church in Portugal, where it is now. Actually, I was wondering about that church. I was thinking, indeed, that would be an interesting thing to look at into where that is that church on which part of land and you know what energetic point that is and i was re- even reading there recently in ireland it used to be a belief that the the soul was was kept in the in the head of the body 
that was a weird thing for me to hear, but also mm. symbolic, right? If you're removing the, right. so for me, that just said, that just felt, okay, you know, Bridget was allowed to stay and be worshipped and be remembered, but yet they also dismembered her. Yeah, You know, like to remove the head, just to like to cap the power, right? Mm-hmm. Like Medusa. Yeah. So it was like a manipulation. It was like, we'll let this goddess energy remain the rest of the goddesses are kind of forgotten about ironically she still exists the spirit of the goddess exists so strongly through her because there are so many people devoted to her as a goddess or a saint it doesn't matter but it's just a kind of a subtle manipulation on it I feel so yeah like you were like you were asking there I I feel that you know gradually this supreme power that these goddesses had and were respected for was was you know was gradually taken over you know the snakes were banished by saint patrick as the story goes that was seen as a good thing from what now we're understanding whether it was he was aware of it or not this was a banishing of the dragon energy mm-hmm. for me i feel the two of Dedan and you know was was a banishing of them their energy um these goddesses were allowed to exist However, they were distilled, like dismembered. Um, so, th- I mean, there is a, a history of, you know, there's a shocking history of, of, of mother and child abuses in, in Ireland. You know, we don't have, you know, it's, it's, we don't have a good relationship with that. I feel the, the Magdalene laundries are something so well known about and um, so well so well, um, they, they only closed 25 years ago. I would love it if you could just explain. I know you have it up here, Indy, but mm-hmm. if you could just explain what the laundry facilities, <laughs> the Magdalene laundries are just for people who don't know and who might not be able to read this, um, you know, because I, whenever I learn anything about this, I become completely enraged this to me is so disgusting what was done to these women on into like you're saying as late as 25 years ago i just feel like we should be screaming from the rooftops about this is one example of what's gone on with women to bond them and enslave them and shame them and take their womb power and goodness knows Mm -hmm. what else they were doing in these locations Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's so, it's almost like when I feel, I'm like, why aren't we screaming about it? It's because I feel it's like victims of an abuse are almost numb to the abuse, especially when it's so recent. They can't discern how bad something truly is when it's so recent. It's so everyone in our, everyone knows about the Magdalene Laundries. There's films about them. There's very well-known films about them. It's an accepted thing. You know, it only struck me the other day because the, the word Magdalene Laundry is so familiar to me all my life as every Irish person. It only struck me, oh, it's Mary Magdalene. Oh my God, they were taking the yeah. name of Mary Magdalene and associating her with fallen women and prostitution. And they were, you know, combining this, uh, making this association so strong, which is like a spell in itself, right? Right. Illegitimate, quote unquote, illegitimate pregnancies. <laughs> yes, <laughs> which could have been rapes. Laundry. They could have been, like, they could have been. Slavement laundry, first of all, that something needs to be cleaned. Yeah. And then enslavement, like the women, you know, becoming these Irish washerwomen, like busting their hands to clean clothes for God knows who, you know, it's like the whole thing is disgusting. Yeah. So they desecrated Mary Magdalene's energy down to the title of prostitution. But was this were these facilities doubling as like actual laundry facilities? So they were portraying that these women were doing laundry, but really they were, it was a secret prostitution ring or they were just, or no. actually just taking their babies and selling them. There was a yeah. lot of things going on. What what exactly was this about? Maybe yeah, no, I think the prostitution thing is just, they, you know, Mary Magdalene obviously was deemed that as a fallen woman. And they obviously named these institutions, you know, after Mary Magdalene to kind of further stamp that. 
However, these were institutions that were literally slavery, you know, institutions that were networked across the entire country, which were institutions for fallen women, which was such a generic title where, you know, any woman could be sent there who was pregnant outside wedlock. They could have been raped. Um, They could have been perceived as crazy. You know, it's like a witch hunt in another form. Um, So really there were there were the the parish priest could have taken a dislike to a family to, uh, you know, it, there could have been any set of circumstances where women ended up there um, and would have often had to stay there for life. You know, their energies were used. Um, uh, w- there were a lot of them who were pregnant, would have ha- had the babies. Mm-hmm. You know, the babies were sold in many cases as, you know, to to America for adoption, for adoption from like respectable mm-hmm. Catholic institutions um, mm-hmm. they were never put in touch a lot of you read so many stories like this across across the world today of people trying to find their original mothers um there was also some absolutely shocking um atrocities that happened in these institutions or connected to these which resulted in a lot of infant deaths and babies deaths. Um, recently, a really brave woman, actually a whistleblower, was on this case for many years and just very recently exposed this whole mass graveyard of thousands of babies. Again, like there is no good reason why these all died. Um, you know, poor excuses are given, but it's, mm-hmm. it's an insane amount of child deaths, which again... You know, when you're looking at the whole thing and the grid work and the energies, you know, all these young infant deaths, like where is that energy going? How is it being used? Who's being manipulated to to garner this energy? You know, it was all in the guise of an institution that would be helpful to fallen women. But, you know, that's just a total manipulation in itself, as we know. So, yeah, I think we should be screaming about it. But again, I just I feel the analogy for me is that it's like an abuse victim that still can't discern really the the horror of what really happened. And then it's somehow accepted, you know. Right, right. And it, there's and it's really an ignorance. And I say the word ignorance just because it's unknowing, right? It's it's that wounding that's generationally passed down. So the parents mm-hmm. are grooming the next generation into the same thing. So it's something that they're just not aware of that they're basically, you know, instead of breaking those chains and break, breaking those cycles of trauma and breaking those implants of the forest breeding programs, because that's essentially what this Mary Magdalene facility, laundry facilities were, I mean, this is the result of the forest breeding programs. Yeah. And weren't they, were they run by nuns, Zoe? Yeah. Yeah. So here we have the virgin priestesses who go from being divine birth oracles of the ancient world into vestal virgins whose wombs get siphoned off. Their womb power gets used to fuel the fire for the Roman reptilian state. And now then we have the nuns of a certain institute religious institution that are the complete inversion of this and get into this sadistic behavior in their sexual energy their own sexual energy is subverted and they are the ones at whose hands these women are further suffering and goodness knows why these children were killed under what circumstances was this ritual were these ritual deaths and were these women actually doing laundry? Yeah. Right. That's why I'm like, is this doubling as something like, were they just posing as laundry facilities and really just running these really corrupt type things, you know, on the set, like underneath everything? No, I mean, there was, they were literally laundries. They were, I suppose, the idea being that they were, um, you know, they were these institutions to help you know, give fallen women, you know, a role or double as a, you know, something productive. Useful for society. Yeah. 
Yeah. So this is just all really, I know for everyone watching today, you might be taking this stuff in for the first time and just kind of processing some of this history because I did not even know about these until Zoe, you came and told me about them. So I just want to say thank you so much. So I know other people watching today have probably never heard of this stuff ever before. So I just really appreciate you guys like kind of explaining everything because, um, you know, this is probably why people are not really screaming on the rooftop about this stuff because this is a lot of buried history. It's really um, in our trauma bodies for one, too. So to kind of talk about this stuff, I think we're stirring up the trauma and the pain bodies of the siphoning of our sexual energies, again, removing and releasing floor delice implants and everything else that's happened to the female losing control over the female body. You know, when it comes to like even just things simply as birth control and going on into, um, you know, abortion laws and rights and things about this, which I don't want to go into that topic, but um, it's all connected. And you let's know? connect yeah. the dots. This this is the land of the she. This is the land of the shining ones, right? This is the land of our ancestors who were these holy beings that got themselves under attack by peoples known as the Milesians, whoever they were. And then we have this complete degeneration into the banishing of the dragons, the anesthetizing of the people through alcohol, the shaming of people's sexuality. And all of a sudden, these Magdalene um, laundry facilities for women who have dared to have sex and get pregnant outside of, you know, Christian wedlock. Mm -hmm. And just a note as well um, on this whole subject, you know, these were run by, you know, with the Catholic Church when it came in, it kind of solidified this template or whatever you call it, like with the St. Patrick rescuing, you know, banishing the snakes. And then the church came in, the divine feminine suppressed, goddess Bridget became Saint Bridget, and just gradually this became. But, you know, the Catholic institutions um, across Ireland, not just the Magdalene laundries, which were Catholic nuns, but, you know, and there are good people in all of these. There are good, holy people, spiritual people gone into all of these orders, also manipulated. You know, I know them personally, amazing priests and nuns uh, who have done amazing things. So that is also such the tragedy, truly spiritual people. Um, however, there is also so much child sexual abuse amongst the Catholic institutions, especially to males, you know, so there is a huge, you know, also, you know, trauma there to the, to the, to the masculine, you know, primarily child sexual abuse. I, I think it existed in every school run by Catholic priests. There is a huge recurring trauma throughout generation after generation of this, you know, just the other week, there was a huge expose of one of our most well-known schools in the capital this huge abuse scandal came out so it's it's so present it's endemic in every county in ireland mm -hmm. and the impact of it for generations the trauma is just so you have the the female line you know and then the masculine line it's just when then you think back to these beautiful hierogamic unions and sacred marriages it's like the total desecration of both lines actually that's you right know? and then we have the migration of a lot of irish people into boston well, and where was it that the boss that that this pedophilic ring um this abuse ring was exposed in boston the boston globe wasn't it that film um that showed you know where these people started talking up and this lawyer finally connected all the dots and then all these archdioceses in the United States where, you know, as we know, it's a whole worldwide thing, mm -hmm. but just to continue the actual migration of the peoples into the Boston area where there's a large, you know, population of Irish, the whole thing is so crazy and it just keeps going on and on. In the email that you sent me, Zoe, you had talked about just, the sexual trauma of the men in Ireland and um, 
and you don't have to go into it if you don't want to, but you had brought up, you know, some of the stuff that you've researched or observed with the prostitution. And um, I think some of the feedback from the prostitutes and the, the sexual trauma that the men in Ireland were holding, if you want to touch on that briefly. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I just as a research subject for a documentary that we, we never made in the end, I researched for a couple of years with prostitutes prostitutes that were coming into that were working in Ireland they were foreign because it was a a hub um for indoor prostitution um Ireland had become kind of recently and so it was seen viewed as a great place to work actually Ireland for like there was a lot of Africans Eastern Europeans South American girls that were here um there was a lot of trafficking actually happening also within these networks, you know. Um, but I, you know, I spoke to a lot of the women who, um, I suppose, like, you know, they were just such an interesting um, reflection on our, what I just thought was like, oh, how messed up our sexual sexuality is. And I just presume, oh, this is all because of the Catholic Church, which, you know, has contributed to it. But, you know, really they said like, they liked working in Ireland because the men were so kind, which is a lovely thing. It's so soft compared to a lot of areas they would have worked in around the globe where prostitution is was really violent. And they said really that violence didn't exist in the kind of the hearts of men, which I think is a beautiful thing in the scheme of it. But the tragedy was that they were, they said they were some of the most messed up sexually people that they men that they had encountered that it wasn't and yet they liked working here because of their gentleness their kindness but that it was just like that they were not in touch with their sexuality and they weren't getting that connection from their female counterparts either so um I remember like them saying to me well you know I'm sure your partner is prostitutes you know because all the Irish women they 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 don't have good sexual relationships with the men you know I was kind of insulted because I was like oh how do they know but like now looking back at this it was so interesting their perception which essentially is their perception of the sexual misery programs the trauma really which has incurred through the female lines and the masculine lines I feel um does that kind of yeah to yeah definitely um I think this topic in itself, I think we can definitely start going into a whole other segment of this. Um, And, and if we, and if we did, I really would like to tie in um, more, uh, uh, you know, like how do we overcome this stuff? How do we see this more in terms of healing? You know, what do we do for the people in Ireland? Because that does seem to be, you know, like they're targeted they're targeted individuals it's a targeted land and you know why is it that it is that way and it's because of creation history and your ancient roots and the she and eru and the portals that exist there and the heroes gamos and i and it, and it does seem like it comes back to that desecration again of the sophianic body but also the number one goal which is to destroy the nuclear family and to destroy gender principles and to destroy um the connection between man and woman which is they want to corrupt and take down us at the core of what we are um and you know so yeah i would like to be able to get into like well how do we oh i think we're still figuring this out as a collective because it's such a core world wound and it's mm-hmm. yeah it's a tough one I feel it's like, I to, feel like yeah, to, be po- to be positive like you say like that's what I see as positive is that these the two who did and are coming into our collective consciousness and consciousness now for this reason that we come into remembrance of this union that is within us like their message to me always is you know, to reclaim this notion of the sovereignty goddess for the masculine and the feminine. And, you know, just by remembering, by talking about it, by having these conversations, we're bringing the light into it. We're reclaiming, you know, what existed. And this was the original template that existed. So that's the true one. Everything else is the inversion. We just need to go back to the true one and reclaim it. There's a lot of crap in the way with regards trauma, but 
we can get over that and return to these true templates, you know, and then heal that within ourselves, that heals the land. Yes, it's work to go and undo our trauma, but this is part of it by talking about it and looking at it, but also remembering the positive, you know, to reclaim this notion of the sovereignty goddess, which is reclaiming your direct, our direct connection to source, you know, and our direct connection to the land. That's what they always say to heal, connect with the land. She knows, you know, she brings us into a healing space and connect to our own direct connection. And that's how we start restoring this sacred marriage within ourselves. As we do that, then we restore it within the land. Um, you know, I also in Ireland to talk, I'm not a spokesperson or an expert at all for the Irish people, but this is just my experience. And, you know, to look at all this particular targeting, which I do feel is true, you know, that's also because we have great spirit and great heart and great land. And that's the positive thing I feel to focus on as well. Yeah. And I think that as these conversations go out among Irish people, it will help them to lift the veils off of their eyes and understand what's been going on, maybe get good and darn mad, um, but start looking into more and more investigating this, you know, connecting with Zoe and others, because this is just the first layer of, of this, uh, this lifting off of this veil. And then working directly with the she who have a strong connection with the fae. So playing on the land, cavorting with the fairies, doing their dances, um, you know, they're all about play. They're all about laughter. They're all about fun. Finding out, you know, what, just getting in with them. I mean, I've got courses about the fairies, awakening to our fairy kin. I know there are other courses and um, they will help. You know, because they're not really about anger and the resentments and holding the resentments and so forth. They're like, well, let's get on with the new earth co-creation. So there's lots to be done that's positive. So let's kind of end it on that note then. Let's take a second to maybe just um, wrap it up and we'll tell everybody about the services that you offer and uh, so this is uh, Marguerite's website, seven sisters, mystery school.com. And maybe just tell us a little bit about what you have um, for yeah. everyone. If you hover over the online offerings, Indy, um, you'll see that up will come the connection with the Fae, the she and Guinevere. And there's two courses there that people can take that are just going to really open your sight, your understanding, your heart. Um so those are really wonderful resources. They also provide experiential opportunities for you to get in with the she, the fey, the sovereignty goddesses, um, Arthur, Guinevere, the original Essenes, Mother Mary energy, Jesus energy, Christ Sophia energy. Okay, so by us doing all of these activities and practices, we start building up our muscles around this. We start incorporating in, it into our way of being. We become empowered and we are able to move forward with that personally and also collectively. So these are these are great starts right here. Awesome, guys. So yeah, you can go and sign up for Marguerite's courses. Um, Marguerite, I personally think that you are amazing and I really do recommend um, if you feel activated or you resonate with this at all to um, go and check out um, Marguerite's Mystery School. You can also um, subscribe to her YouTube channel. So go on and help her out. She's at 3.8K subscribers. So let's see if we can boost her up some more as well. And um, also, Zoe, you are also doing incredible things as well. I had your website pulled up. Um, I believe it is here. So maybe tell us a little bit about also what it is that you're doing. Yeah, well, first of all, I did all Marguerite's courses, which really put me in touch with my own roots, which is amazing, you know, to go as an Irish person to learn Marguerite talking about all this and put me back in touch with that. And 
in the I'm doing your grid working course and I did your guys your womb thing which has been really helping me get in touch with my own roots so it's amazing all these things these pieces so this company uh was a dream of mine for for so long to reclaim all the Irish wool was being exported we were importing all our Irish wool the farmers were getting trashed they were all their the wool in Ireland was being devalued so we started this company, my partner's farmer. We started this company last year to um, put a value back on Irish wool. So we're literally sourcing direct from the farmer, incentivizing them, paying them a higher price for their wool, which was being driven down by the markets. And we have a fair trade network set up where we source direct from his farm and these farmers around. There's a video on it there um, around the country. And we're literally making these beautiful woolen blankets. They're handmade. Everything is totally circular, sustainable. And I really believe sheep's wool is an amazing, um, you know, product. Like I think it's got m many metaphysical properties that I don't even fully understand yet. Not only are they cozy and amazing, but they're amazing for meditation, for connecting. Um, I think you saw the Earth Star Marguerite gifted her a blanket and she felt into the wool and this these codes came out of her and she said they were helping with the grid work in Egypt. So I, I really feel they carry, you know, something magical. Very that can help that's Very that's amazing too, because yesterday I just did a show on the sheep circling. I saw that. <laughs> <laughs> There's an event going on um, in Mongolia where the sheep were circling for 12 to 14 days. And it's just really drawing a lot of attention around what it is they're doing. Are they opening up portals? Are they anchoring in God consciousness? Um, are they waking people up? So yeah, I think you're right. There is something in the wool of the sheep. Yeah. Um, so yeah, perfect timing, so, all synchronistically yeah. aligned. That's so beautiful. Yeah. So, um, so, I also wanted to offer to everyone watching today too, that if you go and purchase one of these blankets. Um, I have a coupon code. It's Indigo Angel, all one word, and you will get 10% off of one of these blankets. So yeah, and I'm excited because I have one coming on the way for me. So I can't wait to get it and use it and experience it and pick up on all the spiritual energy within the sheep's wool. Um, and then also I wanted to highlight too, we have uh, Zoe just started a YouTube channel. She she just started it yesterday. So I Woo! wanted to highlight this. I think you're going to do amazing and I'm so excited for you. So yeah, everyone go and subscribe to her channel. Let's see if we cannot <laughs> get her started and get her rolling. So thank you awesome. so much. Well, thank you ladies for coming on the show today. I really appreciate your energy, your time, your wisdom, everything. Um, so thank you so much for being here. All the links for everything we discussed will be down in the description. And thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you so much.